Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be in worship this morning, church. Glad that you're here with us, whether you're in person or whether you're on, on video. We're glad that you're able to join us for worship today. We'll make this place a sanctuary. Uh, so we'll be surrounded by stained glass windows or we'll be surrounded by, by our couch and our curtains. Wherever you are is a sanctuary today. There is a new prayer post feature on the FUMC Friends page. If you haven't joined that yet, go ahead and join FUMC Friends on the Facebook page. And there's a new prayer request feature where you push the, the prayer button and it comes up as a prayer request and other people can pray for you. Rather than a like, you get a, the people are praying for you. A real simple thing, but I think it's something that might be useful to us. So go ahead and try that. Also posted the third session of the Bible study on there. Palm Sunday, the children are going to be parading with palms, so uh, make sure that, that you're uh, here and enjoying that. If you're at home, uh, make sure that, that you plan to come that Sunday and bring the kids so we have a nice crowd to parade for us. Perhaps you saw the, glo the article about the Global Methodist Church in the Omaha paper. That was a nice article, but I just want to bring to your attention that at this point, nothing is changing. It'll be a year from September, be September 20, of 2022 before the general conference meets. So at this point, uh, nothing has changed. Things could change between now and then, um, but we can't say for sure. But that's when the decision will be made at general conference. So whatever you see, don't get worried about it. It's a long time before anything's going to change. I've had both of my COVID shots. Maybe you have too. If you've had both of your COVID shots and you would like to have me come visit, uh, just let me know. I'll be contacting my usuals uh, so that uh, I can start visiting them if they've had both of their shots. Uh, trying to be safe for everybody, but I think we can safely do that uh, when you're ready. So if you'd like a visit, just let me know. Carol has an announcement for us before the video this morning. So this past week, we got an email from Midwest Mission Distribution Center that they had sent $153,757 worth of um, food and supplies to Food for the Poor in Haiti. Among those things that were sent were over 300 um, school kits that we made and also the, all of the layettes that we made. So just letting you know, we are contacted when uh, the things that we give to Midwest Mission are, are distributed. Also, in that uh, shipment were medical supplies, building supplies, furniture. Um, you saw last week what they do with sewing machines. And so in that shipment were also 15 bikes. And you'll see the video here about what they do with bikes. But if you're wondering, um, so we do the lay, we do the kits, but how do we get all this other stuff to them? We are so very fortunate that only 27 miles down the road in Jefferson, Iowa, at the United Methodist Church, there is um, a container, and it is the um, point that they have in Iowa, the collection point for all of these things that we may have that we didn't even know they needed. So here's the video with what they do with the bicycles. Midwest Mission is often known for the many kits that we make here that go in the United States in response to disaster and around the world in response to humanitarian and education and health relief. But one of the other things that we do here that makes us unique is many projects. We have a sewing machine repair shop, a place that is, makes desk out of reclaimed bleacher wood and a bicycle repair shop. These shops are all run by missionaries. One thing we know that transportation is a barrier to poverty, one of the largest barriers that people in poverty face. And that's whether it's in the United States or abroad. 
and bikes can help break down that barrier. Bikes rest under our micro business section of what we do here at Midwest Mission because when we give a bike to somebody in a developing country, they can turn that into a delivery service. And they oftentimes do. We've gotten many pictures back of people doing just that. But bikes also can create a distance that would be too far to go to school, to go to work, or to get healthcare and take that and make that manageable. In the United States, we've also seen that with students not being able to get from work to a bus stop in time, but when you give them a bike, it makes it possible. So we have people that regularly come into our bike shop and work. People donate bikes here. We take bikes of all sizes and they repair those bikes and get them in good working order, make sure there's reflectors on them. And then we ship those around the world. Uh, they go out on almost every international shipment. And then we take requests for those in the United States as well, because as we fight not only uh, transportation issues with poverty, we also fight obesity epidemics. So giving a kid a bike can help them get active and find something they like to do. So our bike shop prepares 500 to 600 bikes each year. Last year, they spent zero dollars to make that happen. Now, we have some very committed missionaries who work back there on a regular basis that might sneak some of those supplies in. But this year, the only thing we've bought is reflectors that we ran out of. So what they do is take the bikes that they can repair and are worthy of repairing and repair those. And then the ones that aren't, they take them and break them down and take the parts that they can use and put them in their supply. And that's how they are able to do this at such an incredibly low price. Bikes Repair keeps these bikes out of landfills. Uh, we are green here at Midwest Mission. Last year, we recycled 172,000 pounds. So we pride ourselves on taking things that might be cast away by somebody else and making them a beautiful gift that will change the life of somebody else as they receive it. We wanna show God's love in a practical way, but more importantly, showing the grace of God and how big and great and wonderful God can be. And we hope that through them receiving something from the people of Midwest Mission that do this because of Jesus Christ, and we let them know that, that they will draw closer to Christ through receiving one of these amazing gifts. Our call to worship this morning. As we are called into worship today, 
It is sobering to remember that when God appeared on earth in the person of Jesus, most of the world did not recognize him and therefore did not worship him. Today we ask for the faith that will open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is, that we might worship him in truth. People of God, behold and see our God. Open our eyes to see his glory. We open our eyes to hear his wisdom. We open our hands to offer him gifts. We open our mouths to sing his praises. We open our hearts to offer him our love. He is Lord. Would you stand? Everybody from this side, turn, to people, turn toward each other. That's the way to do it. Say it. Turn toward each other. Would this side say, the peace of Christ be with you? The peace of Christ be with you. And this side, also with you. Also with you. And now this side, the peace of Christ be with you. And this side, and also with you. Amen. You may be seated. What concerns or joys do you have this morning that you'd like to lift up? Thank you, Jake. Yes. Jake has been such a, such a gift to us uh, and, uh, and will continue to be a, a gift to us. By the way, you can also look forward to Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday because Nancy and Ellen want to play on those Sundays. So you get to hear uh, Nancy and Ellen those days too. Uh, so that's, uh, we, we're lucky to have all of these gifted musicians among us. I'm aware of some folks who are going to be having surgery in the near future. Uh, not sure uh, if all of them want to be, to be named. I know last week Reggie mentioned that he's going to be having surgery coming up. Uh, so we want to lift him up in prayer and others who are planning on surgery as well. Just, just going out of town and uh, eating at Chick-fil-A and going to Hobby Lobby uh, is an adventure these days, isn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, we needed about three little packages of things for the, for the church that I could have ordered online, but I wanted an excuse to get out of town, so we made a trip to Ames. Uh, so it, it was nice to just get out on a beautiful sunny day. If there's nothing else this morning, yeah, Carroll Middle School boy uh, died last weekend. We want to lift them up, uh, lift up that family, and lift up all the students. We had a, a good talk about that in uh, Faith Exploration this week. Uh, it's a hard thing uh, for anyone, but particularly for that age, uh, when it's something that was unexpected. No one knows the cause yet, but it was, uh, was unexpected, and his friends were, were dealing with that. So uh, please lift all of them up in prayer. Thank you. If there's nothing else at this time, uh, would you allow me to lead you in the pastoral prayer? And then I'm going to stop, and there will be a time of silent prayer. I invite you to continue praying in that time. Lift up all the things that are in your mind and your heart. Then when we get to the Lord's Prayer, if you'd like to quietly join me in the Lord's Prayer, you may. 
Loving God, we yearn for you. Deep inside, we desire to know that you love and accept us just as we are. We seek release from our past mistakes and our regrets. Grant us the opportunity to move beyond our hurt and our cowardice and the pain of our lives. And give us direction. Lead us and guide us as we make important decisions, as we face circumstances with which we must cope. In all of this, we yearn for you and seek your word. As we draw closer to the cross this Lenten season, we, like the disciples and others, seek to understand the mystery of Christ who draws all people unto himself. We need the reassurance that, that you are present with us, even in difficult times, knowing that, that you do not abandon us in our time of need. Help us to live trusting you, deeply trusting that you can redeem all things, even seemingly hopeless situations around us. We pray for our servants who give their lives to protect and save others, police officers, firefighters, pilots, soldiers. We pray for those who are incarcerated and for their loved ones. Release those who are caught in human trafficking. We ask, dear God, that you would comfort all who mourn the loss of loved ones or the loss of a job or the loss of a home. Bring healing to those who suffer from illness or injury. Repair relationships that are strained. Bring a sense of purpose back to those who feel lost. Restore us all in the joyful living, full and abundant lives. We bring our hearts to you in silence. Lord, all that is on our hearts, all that is in our minds, we bring to you as we pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from Luke 5, verses 12 through 16. Once, when he was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and Jesus ordered him to tell no one. Go, he said, and show yourself to the priest, and as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases, but he would withdraw to a deserted place and pray. You might know the name Bill Wilson, but maybe you don't. I'm sure you know his work. Bill was in New Bedford, Connecticut, learning to use a machine gun to be sent off to Europe in World War I. While he was there, he went to some sort of social event, and they offered him a drink. He didn't come from a home that drank. He'd never had alcohol before, but he thought it was a polite thing to do, so he took it. A week or two later, he went to another event, and they offered him another drink, which led to another, and he thought he'd found the elixir of life. He was sent to Europe. He came back. His family was falling apart. He'd made and lost a fortune, and he was a fall-down drunk. One day, Bill met a friend who also was an alcoholic, and he offered that friend a drink, and he said, no, I've been... I've been clean for two months. And Bill kind of scoffed at him. The friend said, you know, I, I found religion. I, I, I did. Just admit that you have no power. Admit that you need help. And place your life in God's hands. And Bill said, well, last summer an alcoholic, this summer a crackpot. And he moved on. About a month later, Bill found himself in rehab for his alcoholism. And he was experiencing some of the worst withdrawal symptoms you can imagine. It can be very, very painful and uncomfortable and difficult to withdraw from alcohol. And he was experiencing the worst of the worst. And finally, he cried out, If there's a God, show yourself. In a moment, there was light. And the pain was gone. And he felt like he was on a mountaintop. From then on, Bill never had a drink. For the next 36 years of his life, he spent his time helping other alcoholics. 2.1 million people a year turned to Alcoholics Anonymous, the organization that Bill started. And they, they say that the average sobriety is 10 years. Now, that doesn't mean they don't go back and become sober again, but the average sobriety is 10 years. And for people who've had such a problem, 10 years is a long time. It's a lot of life to give them. But it's kind of strange. Alcoholics Anonymous is just downright unscientific. From a medical perspective, they don't deal with the, with the, the causes of addiction, the medical causes of addiction. They don't deal with, with helping people through withdrawal. They... They just are non-scientific, it seems like. And that 12 steps that you know from, from AA, the 12, uh, Bill just dreamed up a number, and he said 12 because there were 12 apostles. And for a, for a fellow who didn't believe in God before this, it's kind of strange that seven out of the 12 steps mention God. You know, but you can't argue with something that works, right? It might not be scientific from a medical perspective, but it is scientific from a habit and a psychological perspective. You see, Alcoholics Anonymous addresses that habit, habit cycle that we've been talking about for the last several weeks. They, they take pains to make sure that they're intervening in that cycle. For instance, 
We've talked about identifying the cues for our habits, identifying the cues for our behavior. The fourth and fifth steps in the 12 steps make a searching and fearless inventory of ourselves and admit to God and ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Going back, looking at the causes, looking at the, the cues for our alcoholism and also the rewards which aren't always rewards. Sometimes they're more trouble than rewards, but you'd be surprised. As you look at the, the rewards that people name for alcohol, it's not, that, it's not the, the inebriation that people are after. It's the escape. It's the escape. It's the, it's the, the being free from pain. It's the fact that they don't know how to socialize if they don't have a drink in their hand. It's that connection that they see in the bar that they don't see anywhere else. It's things like that that people name as the reward for drinking. So they're identifying the trigger. They're identifying the reward. And then they've got this behavior in the middle, and that is the drinking itself, right? What do they do? They substitute group meetings and sponsors for going out to drink. When you want to drink, what are you supposed to do? Go to a meeting. What are you supposed to do? Call your sponsor. That's the substitute behavior that they use in Alcoholics Anonymous to change the habit of these folks. Now, you know, that doesn't go down and address the causes of alcoholism. You can't change those cues, but it changes the behavior. And that's the change that they need. In order to change that behavior, they need to substitute something for the drinking. The 12-step programs have grown into all kinds of programs for uh, alcohol and tobacco and drugs and gambling and overeating and self-mutilation and sex addiction and video games and emotional dependency and dozens of other destructive habits. I figure if it works for drugs and alcohol and tobacco that have that biochemical dependency, it should work for our other habits as well. Breaking that habit cycle, changing our behavior in the middle of that cycle, substituting a new behavior should work for us as well. Whether you're trying to change your your habit of of gossiping or uh, procrastination or being tardy or cussing or pornography or greed or whatever habit you're trying to change, if it works for AA, it probably will work for us if we try. Find those triggers. Identify the rewards, and then substitute that behavior. Substitute your your old destructive behavior with something that's less destructive, something that hopefully is actually productive and healthy. No one's going to tell you that it's easy. No one's going to tell you that changing a habit is easy because it is not. That's the nature of habits. Remember the basal ganglia back here buried in our brain? That's where these are. And it's really hard to change things once they're engraved in that part of our brain. But you can do it. You can do it. If an alcoholic or a person who's addicted can change their habits through an organization like AA, we can change our habits too, whatever they might be. Taking the AA model, we have to, have to do a couple things. One, we have to stop lying to ourselves. There are six or seven lies, at least, that we tell ourselves when we have a habit that we should change, we know we should. For instance, we might say, I've never been able to change it till now. Why would I think I could change it now? Or we might say, uh, just once won't hurt. Now, take those words and put them on the lips of an alcoholic, and you'll understand how silly that is for us when we're dealing with our habits. Same principle. Or, my habit isn't hurting anyone. You've heard that before. Well, maybe it isn't, but maybe it is. Think about, think about your relationship, your jobs, your finances, your health. And if nothing else, the, the issue of being imprisoned by a habit being imprisoned by your behavior is enough to want us to ch- make us change. Another lie, it, it shouldn't be so hard. If God wanted me to change, he'd help me. And the, the other side of that is I can always be forgiven for it. Well, those are just plain silly, aren't they? Because God does help us. And yes, we can be forgiven, but that's not an excuse. 
And the final excuse, I can do it on my own. That's the three-year-old excuse, right? I can do it on my own. Well, if you could have, you would have. So we need help, don't we? That's the second thing that we learn from Alcoholics Anonymous as they break these cycles is they offer support. We need people to support us. We need people to care for us, to encourage us, to hold us accountable, to celebrate when we win, and to pick us up when we fall down. Once we've admitted the problem, we need to make sure that we've got people who can support us and care for us. The second thing that helps us is knowing that if we've got a big habit, we can take it in little pieces to change it. Take one little piece of the behavior and change it. I had a friend when I was doing construction that was a terrible smoker, and he decided he wanted to quit. He said, I'm going to quit one cigarette at a time. So instead of smoking three cigarettes at our morning break, he smoked two. And then he went to another time, and he reduced that by one cigarette. And he went to another cue, and he reduced that by one. And eventually, he got down to the point where he quit. It was amazing. Now, the thing is, he substituted the behavior of talking instead of smoking. And some of his talk was, was so coarse that I kind of wanted to stick a cigarette in his mouth to keep him quiet. But I'm glad that he quit anyway. It can work. One step at a time. How do you eat an elephant? You know this old question, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It's the same thing dealing with our big habits. So you've got get support, make sure you've got accountability and support around you, break the habit into smaller pieces, and finally pray. Maybe pray should be first, middle, and last, but pray. Surround yourself, bathe your attempts to change in prayer, and God will be there to help. Now this week's spiritual habit that I want to talk about is silence and solitude. This might be the easiest one and the hardest one at the same time for us. We live in a world that's addicted to noise. Wherever we go, there's, there seems to be noise. There's, there's music playing over the speakers. We've got the earbuds in when we're walking. We've got the TV on in the background or the radio on while we're driving or whatever it is. People are just addicted to noise. And we don't take time to just stop. We don't take time to stop and listen. I believe that God still speaks. God still speaks to us. But if we're always listening to something else, how are we ever going to hear? We need to, to break ourselves of that habit of always filling our life with noise and, and begin to experience the silence. Did anybody feel a little bit uncomfortable during the silent prayer? It went on for longer than usual. I didn't want to make you too uncomfortable. Probably somebody was starting to wonder, did he fall asleep or what, right? But silence is good for us. We don't have to be uncomfortable. We don't have to be afraid. Silence is good for us. I love solitude and silence. Let me give you a, 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 a proverb that might encourage you to explore silence, and that is Proverbs 17, 28. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. Their mouths shut, with their mouths shut, they seem intelligent. We all want to seem intelligent, right? Now, that's not a good reason for pursuing silence and solitude, but it is a reason. A better reason is following Jesus' example. In today's scripture, he healed the leper, and then he tells him, you know, don't tell anybody. Now, that's, we've always wondered, you know, why does Jesus do that? Doesn't he want everyone to know? But when you read this, you kind of get a sense that maybe Jesus is tired Maybe Jesus is tired because all these people are coming around and asking things. As he gets more popular, he's in more demand. As he, as he heals more people, more people want to be healed. And he just needed some rest. He says, don't tell anybody, okay? Just please, don't tell anybody. And then he went away to a lonely place to pray. I find five other places in the gospel. There could be more, but I found five others that where Jesus goes away to a lonely place to pray. He knew that there was time for silence. He knew there was a time for solitude and silence in our lives. And he provided that example for us. We need to follow that example too. We need to know that rhythm. That's why the Sabbath is part of our weekly rhythm in Scripture is because we need that break. We can take that break every day if we choose to. 
Let me give you a few examples of how you could, could add some silence into your lives. Go for a walk. By yourself, no earbuds. Two rules. By yourself and no earbuds. Just walk. Open your ears. Open your mind and, and clear out that conversation that we all have going in our minds all the time. Just, just clear that out and listen. I believe God speaks to us. And God may speak to you loud and clear, or God may just doodle a little bit. But listen. It doesn't matter if you, if you walk fast or slow as long as you listen. It doesn't matter if you go a short distance or if you walk four miles as long as you're alone. Listen. Add that to your rhythm, the rhythm of your life. And you can find benefit in silence. Another way, another way would be to forgot my second one. Um, oh, when you're praying. When you're praying, instead of going quick to the sign off, you know, in Jesus' name, amen, how about you get to the end of your prayer and you stop. And you say, Lord, I'm listening. And then you spend as much time listening as you spent talking. What would happen? You just might hear God speak. It's a great way to add some silence into our lives. It's a great way to stop and listen for God. Or maybe a third way, maybe you have a place in your home or in your yard. I like my swing in the backyard that I talked about last week where you can, you can just go and you can be silent. When it's dark outside and I don't have the distractions of things that I, that I see to go out and just watch the stars to just swing and watch the stars, clear my mind, listen to the silence, listen for God is a gift. And maybe you've got a favorite corner, maybe you've got a favorite room, a favorite chair. Find a place that you associate with silence. And that can be part of your life too. And, and let's take a moment now and just experience some silence. And I'd, I'd like you to just get comfortable and just clear your mind. Don't be thinking about what I'm saying so much. Just clear your mind. And then start relaxing yourself, starting from your toes and then your ankles and your calves and your thighs. And your back and your abdomen and your neck. For some of you, this might be the longest period of silence you've had all week. Take this silence and tuck it into your heart. Carry it with you. Our closing song is In the Garden. You can continue your, your silencing your mind as we listen to the music. And the 
joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry has ever known. Go now with the silence in your heart and the silence in your mind. Bring some quiet to the world around you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.